my goal has been to try to see how, you know, how can we address anxiety and depression for people with epilepsy because it's something that every day in the clinic I hear from patients, it impacts people's lives, quality of life is impacted you know, more by anxiety or depression than by seizures. Anxiety and depression often coexist with epilepsy. Many experts say that anxiety and depression are part of epilepsy. But which is the priority, the anxiety, the depression, or the seizures? And should there be a priority? And really, how can all be addressed simultaneously? Well, today we have a great guest joining us. That is adult epilepsy specialist, Heidi Munger-Clary from the Wake Forest University School of Medicine, North Carolina, US, who tells us about her much needed research into anxiety and depression in people with epilepsy and how we can improve the lives of people affected. Hello, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm an adult epilepsy specialist at the Wake Forest University School of Medicine, which is in North Carolina in the southeastern United States. I specialize in terms of my research interest um, in trying to investigate and close care gaps for people with epilepsy who have anxiety or depression. And I also um, run a epilepsy the adults fellowship of training program. You know, that's a really interesting question. For some reason, I w always assumed that I would go into adult care. And I think part of it is that I really enjoy the direct patient-physician interaction and the richness that you have, you know, working together with the patient. Um, and with children, there's, there's often family involvement with adults as well, but you're often, you know, more directly interacting with the family member than the patient in some situations. And I also really enjoy being able to work with patients uh, together over the years during their lifespan. And in pediatrics, you only have a short period of time where you follow your patients. Oh no, that's a re really cool angle. I hadn't thought of, or nobody's told me about that perspective before. And so why did you choose to focus on um, the epilepsies instead of say Parkinson's or dementia or what are some considered some consider more trendy diseases to be involved in? Now, part of it had to do with that idea of following patients and caring for them across the whole lifespan, you know, through their different life events. For example, Parkinson's disease, that tends to be just an older population, whereas epilepsy affects, you know, young adults, older adults, and it's often um, a situation where you have long-term relationships with your patients. I also um, find it interesting to be able to care for patients across the whole span of acuity, meaning hospitalized patients, outpatients, and that you may care for the same patient in both settings. A lot of different areas of neurology are more focused in one or the other of those areas, the clinic or the hospital. And I like how in epilepsy, we have the opportunity to provide care in both of those settings. Okay, we have a stereotypical neurological epileptologist who might see a patient in their, in their office and they have that appointment once, twice a year, sometimes less frequently. Are you involved in neurophysiology at all, like helping people with their EEGs and MRIs and things like that? And, you know, what happens there? That's another piece of what had led me to choose epilepsy is reading the EEG studies. So I am a neurophysiologist and I read EEGs. I take care of patients in our epilepsy monitoring unit um, where oftentimes we'll bring my own patients there to learn where do their seizures come from and to plan epilepsy surgeries. Um, even, you know, doing EEGs where we have implanted specially um, placed surgical electrodes to try to figure out the best treatment for a difficult to control epilepsy. Um, so I'm involved in the EEG side and then also the patient care side in our epilepsy monitoring unit in the clinic um, and interpreting EEGs for other patients in other areas of the hospital as well. I guess you must see people, patients with various different types of epilepsies, right? So not solely, say, temporal lobe epilepsy or, you know, or not solely people who have generalized seizures. Do you see people on the whole spectrum? Absolutely, the entire spectrum, you know, and ranging from someone who may have acute status epilepticus in the ICU and then they seek, you know, they're seeking care after that acute hospitalization and we're recommending treatments during that. Um, generalized epilepsies, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, the full spectrum, different focal epilepsies that are um, often surgically treated because they're drug resistant. 
stroke-related epilepsy, tumor-related epilepsy, the whole spectrum. So, so interesting. And so going back to your focus on, um, or your passion for, should I say, for the psychiatric comorbidities, I know you had a poster at the EEC conference, ILE conference um, in Geneva. We didn't, I didn't see you there. You were actually there. I was there. Yeah, I didn't see because I was, yeah, I was so ashamed. But anyway, <laughs> tell us about your poster and your research into the psychiatric side of um, people with epilepsy. So, so one, what really drew me to this area of research was seeing that anxiety and depression were so commonly reported by patients. And this goes all the way back to before I became an epileptologist. I was doing a research project looking at charts to see if people had depression. And I saw over and over again, anxiety, anxiety, anxiety in the chart, but nothing was being done about it. Um, and so over time, my goal has been to try to see how, you know, how can we address anxiety and depression for people with epilepsy? Because it's something that every day in the clinic, I hear from patients, it impacts people's lives, quality of life is impacted, you know, more by anxiety or depression than by seizures. And yet most of the time it's not addressed for various reasons. There, oftentimes there are barriers to accessing specialty mental health providers. And so in trying to understand how we can help close the gaps in care for people with anxiety or depression in epilepsy, we had surveyed a number of patients in our um, practice who had anxiety or depression about who they would like to treat this condition and how. And what we found was that people, in at least in our sample, really the, overwhelmingly seemed to want the neurologist to prescribe a medication instead of being referred to a mental health provider. And we wanted to understand more about this um, in depth. So we did a qualitative study interviewing patients to understand their experiences in trying to seek or receiving treatment for anxiety and depression in epilepsy. And you know, there were some things that were really important that came out of that information. For example, it seemed like the amount of trust that the patients had with their neurologist was really a key factor in terms of whether their needs were being met um, and whether their you know, care was meeting their um, needs to address the anxiety or depression. So a lot of themes came out about the way that neurologists communicate with patients and the importance of trust and listening to the patient and seeking to meet those patients' needs in whatever way you know the resources are available. Um, but that interaction and trust and working together, the physician and the patient seemed to be a really important aspect. We also, um, over the course of our research, we have realized that while many patients would like neurologists to prescribe antidepressants, many of the people with epilepsy in our clinic have a more complicated psychiatric situation than a neurologist can handle on their own. Um, they've tried multiple medications, they've had a psychiatric hospitalization in the past, and so we're now really looking to try to implement what's called integrated care, a model of care that includes a mental health specialist, but kind of behind the scenes to help advise um, a team of the neurologist and a care manager to really try to provide specialized input while the patient actually receives treatment prescriptions and other things based in the neurology clinic. And I'll be happy to talk more about that model um, if you're interested. Uh, but we, what we did in this interview uh, project is we described the model of care, which involves the neurologist, a care manager who checks in every two weeks to see how people's anxiety and depression symptoms are doing, and then a psychiatrist behind the scenes who can recommend medication prescribing and some brief therapy that the care manager gives over the phone. And the patients that we interviewed found that the idea of this model seemed very positive to them and something that might be helpful for their setting. So since then, we have obtained funding to work on implementing and testing this model, which is called collaborative care in the neurology clinic. 
it's a model that's been successful in primary care and other conditions, but there's been very little um, work to try to see if it would work in neurology clinics. So we're very excited to move forward and, and see how this works for uh, patients here and um, at another local site at our VA. Gosh, I, mean, I, I really do want to follow up on this to see what happens, because that does sound really exciting. I can say as a, as a well, you know, 30 years experience as an epilepsy patient and psych patient, having, I, I, I now, for instance, I'm very lucky to have a neuropsychiatrist who I can see, and it makes things so much less stressful to have that person connected to my neurologist. So I to totally know what you mean. And also, I think, you know, we don't need to get to know so many people, you know, if we're just, you know, cared for by the same team right and also I think as you know it's a very very can be a very upsetting time or times are, or a person's life can be really upsetting when they're going through these illnesses or diseases and they just want people to help them not to be dragged here there and everywhere and have to tell their story again and again and hope that those other people will understand when often they won't not because you know they're horrid but they just don't have the understanding of psychiatry and neurology or epileptology to understand i think you raise a lot of really important points and those were you know things we were thinking about okay well why is it that people would like the neurology um, clinic to be the care setting. And, you know, it may well be that idea of having to repeat the story to multiple people versus having one home. And, you know, epilepsy, even in the definition of epilepsy, the comorbidities are acknowledged. Anxiety and depression come along with, with epilepsy so frequently. Why should it be completely siloed into separate treatment areas. It's actually all part of the same condition. And I think we can do a lot in the neurology community to try to really bring comprehensive care into the neurology setting, or at least stronger links, you know, to the experts in mental health to work together as a team. And, and as you and just use the word comorbidity, I've started thinking sometimes that actually the epilepsy feels like a comorbidity to the psychiatric issues or the the seizures are the comorbidity. And I think it's kind of a bit of a, like, a mindset change sometimes we, maybe we need, like it depends upon the patient, what is priority, doesn't it? And it doesn't, it doesn't mean that we're saying, oh gosh, you know, the, the person's epilepsy doesn't need looking after. Of course, um, well, the seizures do, but all parts of that epilepsy, including the mental health, which might be priority. Yeah, that's a really important point. And well, for example, when we surveyed patients, you know, 80% said that treating the anxiety or depression was a moderate or very high priority for them. Um, and, you know, what I used to think until we started looking at um, doing screening for all of our patients coming through the clinic, I expected that we would see more anxiety and depression in the people with the more severe epilepsy. And I was surprised to find, you know, that there are so many people who are affected, they may be seizure free for years, but really the anxiety or depression is the most pressing issue. And that's what we're actively managing in our clinic because the seizure medication plan has been working just fine to control the seizures fully for a few years. Thank you for joining us, Heidi. Tori, thanks so much for this conversation. It's really exciting to be able to share some of the perspectives that we've learned over the years from patients and to try to move the field forward towards addressing anxiety and depression in the epilepsy clinics. Thank you so much to Heidi for your professional, genuine, caring insight into helping people with epilepsy who experience anxiety and or depression. To any clinicians nervous of these topics, please do seek advice and training from your lead or contact Heidi. Her contact details are in the text below. For people with epilepsy who are experiencing anxiety and or depression, do bring this up with your neurologist, seriously. And if they aren't sure what to do, refer them to this podcast, to Heidi, and ask them for a referral to somebody who can help you with your mental health, whether it be a therapist, a neuropsychiatrist, whatever suits you. And I don't want to sound like a L'Oreal advert, but you seriously are worth it. And so, so please remember that. Do share this episode with your colleagues, family and friends, if you can, to help the world understand that epilepsy isn't solely about seizures. And that in fact, sometimes the anxiety and depression and even other things, which we will go on to in next week's episode, um, that so many experience can be so debilitating that they are actually of equal or even greater priority to the patient when it comes to treatment and care.